Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm just going to ask uh, your indulgence. Let's save the questions for the end. I think you'll probably have a few from uh, some of the uh, subjects I'm going to discuss. And um, if your phone is on, please turn it off or put it on silent. I don't want you to be embarrassed in case it rings. Uh, okay, well, Rav Johnny started off with the Christmas jokes. I guess I have to do one as well. Um, and the story is told about um, a fellow who, uh, who lived in Israel, and uh, his mother-in-law was visiting him. And uh, Nebuch, while she was visiting, uh, the mother-in-law passed away. And so the Heber Kedisha came, and they said to him, well, First of all, you should know this halacha. If somebody, God forbid, dies in Israel, even if they don't live here, they should be buried here. That's a separate issue. In any case, he said, well, do you want to bury your mother-in-law here in Israel uh, or to send her back to where she lived uh, in Kutzlars? And he said, I think uh, I'd like to send her back there. So they said to him, well, you understand that if we send her back, that's going to cost several thousand dollars for all the arrangements. And if she's buried here, it'll cost uh, a lot less, maybe a few hundred dollars, maybe close to a thousand, but not nearly what it would cost there. And he said, no, I, I think I want to send her back. And he said, well, why? And he said, listen, there once was a man here 2000 years ago, and he died while he was here and he came back to life. I'm not taking that chance with my mother. Okay, so um, as we started to discuss, there is a fine line that we Jews tread as we travel through history. On the one hand, we have spent uh, 2,000 years in exile in every diaspora, uh, including those that desperately tried and wanted to assimilate us, or we tried ourselves to assimilate, that that was something that we, we really worked hard at. And you know, it presents a dilemma. On the one hand, the, you know, that uh, we have a mandate to uh, maintain our distinctiveness and adapt, avoid being absorbed into other cultures or other faiths, uh, which could and probably would lead to our disappearance. And that indeed is what precisely happened to the 10 tribes. People ask, well, how did they just disappear suddenly? Because they were dispersed to other countries. They didn't have a strong uh, religious uh, essence to themselves and connection. And therefore, while in these various other countries, little by little, they adopted the customs of those countries and they melted away only because, thank God, from Israel, we're starting to, some of them to reappear. But basically, they melt into the other nations and poof, they're gone. So we know that Hashem does not want that to happen to us, whether we're in the Galut or whether we're here. So he gave us a command to keep ourselves pristinely Jewish while still maintaining the ability to safely interact with our surroundings. In fact, you know, we just celebrated Hanukkah and Hanukkah, of course, is that story of the Jews of Israel. It's not in the diaspora anymore, the Jews of Israel wanting to absorb the Greek culture and becoming the Mityav, Mityavnim and the whole battle that takes place prior to fighting the Greeks <laughs> by Matityahu, by the, the brothers of Maccabi, that they want to prevent the Jews from diluting Judaism, the whole essence of the Shemin being pure and trying to have that, that, that purity of Judaism so we don't um, again, melt away into another culture. Ironically, Hanukkah comes Dafka at Christmas time when there is really uh, this perverse, pervasive, perverse, pervasive urge to adopt the, uh, the Christmas spirit and a lot of pressure on kids, um, in, especially in mixed schools and the whole battle between uh, the eight days of Hanukkah and the, the many more days of, of Christmas and who gets what presents and the battle of the lights, the lights we have in our window, the tremendous amount of uh, Christmas lights, et cetera. So there's a lot of pressure there. So what I wanna talk about tonight, uh, I want to get into a little bit of the, of the halakha of this very fascinating concept of chukat ha-goyim, about whether or not 
we can adopt customs that are not particular to us as Jews, but nevertheless might not actually be forbidden. So we have two sources for the idea of Chukat The first one is in Parshat Mishpatim. It's in Perak Chav Gimel. Um, uh, and it's Pasuk. Um, let me find the Pasuk for you in one second. So it's actually, sorry, in Vayikra. This is a famous one. We know it. And it says, Don't do what they did in Egypt. Don't copy the culture, the habits of Canaan. Do not walk or do not follow their chukim. Now, there's two things in the other source, uh, which actually comes from Shmot, Chav Gimel. And that's a lesser known, but it's still an important source. Don't bow to their gods or worship them. And don't do the things they do. You shall surely break those down and destroy their uh, idols, etc. Uh, and that is the second source. So two things we see from here that are interesting. Um, number one, we are talking there about cultures that were clearly idolatrous. So one of the ideas is that maybe the command not to adopt any of those customs, maybe that only connects to those which are idolatrous. And not every religion is idolatrous. Islam is not an idolatrous religion. They, they believe in one God. It's a dispute about Christianity, whether it is or isn't. So some might want to argue, it depends what the source of it is. The other word here is hem lotelechu. What is a chok? A chok is a command, a, uh, a, a statute that the reason for which is not necessarily apparent. And that, and that, and that lends itself to the whole definition of chukata goyim. And we'll see that in a moment. So we have many, many commentaries on this concept. And I'm going to give you many examples of practices to see whether where they fall in. So um, the Rama and Rav Moshe Feinstein, just as two sources, they identify three circumstances whereby something would be forbidden. The first would be something that connects to a religion. Now here again, in the Gemara and Megillah, this is where this whole well, the subject is discussed at length, what is idolatrous and what isn't, because anything that is idolatrous, for sure, we cannot have a connection to. But then the dispute that different rabbis contest is what about non-idolatrous religions? So basically anything that connects to another religion, especially if it's idolatrous, that is something we should avoid. So, for example, the custom of knocking on wood, because people hold that comes from a time people, for luck, would knock on the cross. Um, or Halloween, which is certainly connected to another religion. Um, the Gemara talks about certain haircuts, which were religion-based, that we're not allowed to use. Essentially, one of them is where uh, you cut you cut all your hair, but you leave just a little bit on top. Uh, the other one is uh, the opposite, that you leave the top bald and you just grow your hair long around it purposely. I mean, it happens, it happens, but if it doesn't, if it's done purposely, that was something that apparently was connected to certain idolatrous uh, communities. And then of course, as we talked about the Christmas tree, um, my my daughter was invited somewhere for Shabbos for Friday night dinner, and the this is from a family that is, I guess they're they're religious, maybe religious light, but they keep kosher, they keep Shabbos. But they said, um, we just want to tell you that we have a small Christmas tree. I, she she was stunned, and they said, listen, we were on Shlichut, we came to America. And uh, they were Israeli, actually. They came to America and they saw that all these families do it and they thought it's so nice. They have something growing there, etc. And she tried to tell her 
that this is clearly something that Jews don't do. This is Kukat Goyim, And she said, if you have that there, with all due respect, um, I can't, we can't come there. Um, so again, the first qual the qualification is something that connects. Definitely, we know it's connected to another religion, especially if it's idolatrous. The second category is something that we don't know where it comes from. And there's no clue as to what it necessarily connects to, says Rav Moshe, don't do it, because it could very well be that it does come from some idolatrous source, and don't take a chance, this whole business about never cross the path of a black cat. We, When I see a black cat, I purposely cross its path, <laughs> because I don't want to think that there's anything to that, and there's many things like it. Of course, there are certain customs and things people say, don't walk under a ladder. Well, that's just common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not stemming from anything idolatrous. So that would be permitted. And the third uh, qualification is that if it involves something which is immodest um, or certainly something which is forbidden, then of course you can't do it. We're wearing certain immodest clothes, wearing, a, let's say, a blouse that's you know, off the shoulder, that would be something that should be avoided. It's not connected to something idolatrous, but it's not something that we pasnish, right? That's pretty much covers many subjects, as we would say, or tattoos. Now, tattoos are very much in style, but we know that the Torah forbids it. So clearly for that reason alone, but it might also be an issue of um, kukata goyim. A lot of this issue has to do, has to do with clothes. Um, and essentially there is no pro problem with any type of modern, uh, of modest clothing. Uh, Western styles of dress should be no less problematic than 18th century Polish styles of dress. So therefore, if we're going to say that it's Chukata Goyim because you wear a tuxedo, well, it's probably more Chukata Goyim that you're copying the Polish nobility of uh, 150, 200 years ago. By the way, you know, th this all came about, by the way, uh, what was the reason for wearing the strimal, for wearing the, the kapata? Uh, essentially, there's a lot of different opinions, but I think the, 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 the classic idea is that this was specifically done by the rabbinic leaders to lift their followers out of the, a widespread depression that resulted from extreme poverty and persecution. So these Hasidic leaders encouraged their adherents to dress like the non-Jewish elite to kind of pump them up um, and you know to give them this this sense of you know uh, you are what you wear, right? That um, they began to dress uh, with the garb of the Polish or the Russian nobles and princes, etc. And so we see that they held that it's not intrinsically Jewish. It was Dafka not Jewish, but it became Jewish. And clearly there was nothing wrong with it at the time. Rav Avinir says, it is only Chukata Goyim if the non-Jews are the only ones who wear a particular type of clothing. If observant Jews also wear them, there is no such problem. He says, it depends really on the time and the place. Mores change, styles change. And sometimes we go along with that and there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. Uh, a doctor will, may be wearing a white coat and you, you're Jewish, you become a doctor, you wear the white coat. That's what simply what's done. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. And just because it may have been originally adopted by the non-Jewish world, that doesn't mean you can't do it. The same goes with a suit, same goes with a tie, Somebody comes along and says, I can't wear a tie. It's Fukata Goyim. Says Rav Moshe, that's nonsense. This is what people in society are wearing. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. You don't want to wear it. It's up to you, but it's not Fukata Goyim. Um, there's an issue about wearing black at a funeral. And it's a debated issue. Most uh, authorities would permit it because it has no uh, religious significance. I mean, we know that... Um, Haredi wearing black clothes all the time, and certainly doesn't see anything wrong with it. Um, we talk about style, by the way, it's interesting, uh, wearing watches. Now, watches began to be worn by women. There we have an added issue of Begadisha, Begadish, that men 
initially were told, well, don't wear um, watches because that's something feminine. And there was an issue about that until it began to be adopted by society that every men and women wore watches and then it became permissible for us too. And there's no, no problem. And no problem as well of Chukata Goyim uh, also. Um, there's an issue about stockings. Stockings, we say, may have originated actually in the red light districts of certain communities as a way of attracting men. And initially, in, very interesting, because initially uh, there were those uh, post scheme who said uh, women should not wear them. Not only is Chukata Goyim, but it's also something that's associated with immodesty. Now, of course, it's almost laughable because wearing stockings is a is a basic part of the Haredi or Hasidic dress. Just maybe certain types of stockings might be considered immodest, but it, but but uh, stamp to wear stockings, that's no problem. There also is an issue raised about school uniforms. Well, would Jewish schools be allowed to wear uniforms? Because that was something that clearly was started by non-Jewish schools, prep schools, Catholic schools, et cetera. And uh, we know that uh, many, many uh, religious schools have adopted, uh, especially in England, for example, but they've adopted uniforms for various reasons. And there too, once it it's not associated, it's not a religious type of dress, it was something that was not associated with Jews, but when it becomes associated on a wholesale level, on a public level, then Jews can do it as well, as long as it, again, doesn't connect to anything that might be idolatrous or immodest. Um, if something was once a Jewish custom and then taken over by non-Jews, this also becomes an issue of Chukata Goyim. Well, it depends. If it's something the Torah requires or is accepted by the majority of Jews, then it's fine. Then, of course, it can be done. Um, if not, then there is a dispute. Example, flowers at a gravesite. Well, um, many authorities frown on Jews bringing flowers to a funeral or to an askara, et cetera. However, others want to say that it's not of a religious nature. Indeed, the reason to bring flowers might be the same reason that people put a stone on a matseva as an indication that this place was visited and that gives honor to the deceased because when somebody else comes, they say, wow, this is somebody who must have really been a hush of a person. Look at all the stones there. Look at the flowers there. And therefore they would say, it's okay. We started the tradition of throwing rice at weddings. You look back into certain Sephardic circles, rice is, what is rice? Throwing rice at the, usually at the bride more than the groom, unless it's already hardened, then you might want to throw it at the groom. But otherwise, the throwing rice because it's a symbol of fertility. And it was done, this was certainly done by Iraqi Jews uh, in order to indicate or to bless them, you should have, you know, Children, you should be fruitful, like rice, of course, which multiplies. Other people want to say, well, it was adopted by non-Jews, so it becomes a Goyesha custom. And there's a dispute about that. And someone hold that already is Kukata Goyim, even though we had first. Um, even the issue of wearing a kippah. Well, the Pope wears one. The Cardinals wear a kippah. So is it Kukata Goyim? Of course, we would say no, because... Um, we have had a long tradition of covering our heads, right? Some date this back, uh, you know, to the to the to Yaakov, because it says by Yitzhak Yaakov, Yaakov went out. Would he go out without a yarmulke or a hat? Uh, so, kiddingly, but we definitely have sources for it. So, therefore, the fact that the Pope and other uh, Christian uh, clerics wear a uh, a head covering, that doesn't necessarily answer it. It could be, I once, when I was visiting England, to go to, um, um, uh, uh, to go to the famous, uh, where all the, the monarchs buried in, uh, in Westminster Chapel, right? And I went to Westminster Abbey. Um, Abbey, Abbey is a Jewish name, it really shouldn't be a problem, but, uh, when I went in, they said, sir, you will have to take off your hat. 
Uh, you won't be allowed to wear, we don't allow any head covering here. And so, of course, they didn't go in, um, but you know, if it would be the opposite to say everybody has to cover their head, would be no problem to wear a kippah. Um, we, but there are times that we actually, even though something was ours, when it became connected with another religion, that we shy away from it. One of them is prostrating on the floor um, or holding our hands a certain way at prayer, kneeling, full body bowing. These are things that we stop doing, except for, let's say, on Yom Kippur, on the, on the Yamim Noreim, um, because it became a, non, a very accepted non-Jewish religious custom. So even though we, in a sense, had it first, you read about this in Pirkei Avot, it talks about in Yerushalayim, there was always room when people would lay down on the floor and uh, there was never a shortage of space. So you see, we've done it a long time, but we stopped doing it again, possibly because uh, we didn't want to identify um, with this custom, which had become uh, popular among Christians during the time of the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, the rabbis decreed that Jews should cease bowing and folding their hands in prayer um, because this clearly seemed to um, go over the boundary. I want to uh, um, I want to talk about a couple of specific issues, um, especially for those who come from uh, America uh, and I want to say a few words about Thanksgiving. Now, Thanksgiving is a fascinating case because it is, according to most people and most authorities, it is a secular holiday without religious context. Sorry for using the word context. That has a morally positive origin. It originated in 1621 with the Pilgrim celebration at Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts when the colonists celebrated the survival of the harsh winter of 1620-21. The local Native American tribes taught them how to hunt for turkey and plant maize and shared their bounty with the colonists. In 1777, during the Revolutionary War, there was a proclamation of thanksgiving by the Continental Congress. In 1863, President Lincoln issued a thanksgiving proclamation and since then, Thanksgiving has been celebrated annually at the end of November. In 1934, President Roosevelt changed the date to the second to the last Thursday in November in order to increase consumer spending. And that this was confirmed by Congress in 1942. And just as an aside, since I love if you, any of you get my weekly Parsha sheet that I do a trivia, in 2013, Hallel with a bracha was said on Thanksgiving because it fell on Hanukkah and will not fall again on Hanukkah until the year 2070. We'll talk about it then when we get there. Um, so Rav Yehuda Hankin rules that Thanksgiving is not a religious holiday, even if some individuals in America may celebrate it religiously. Um, for us, religiously was watching football and eating turkey. By the way, I'm not gonna get into the whole story of Turkey. Turkey is also very interesting because we know that birds do not have a siman like fish and animals do. So it's based upon what the to who the Torah lists in the families of birds and a tradition that this is a kosher bird. Since turkeys only came around long after this was written, the Torah was written. So it's a whole dispute, but in the end, um, almost all the rabbis conclude, and I'll say a word about this too, um, um, Rav Herschel Schefter records that Rav Soloveitchik permitted eating turkey on Thanksgiving um, and did not prohibit eating it uh, on the grounds that it lacked a proper Masora. And although Rav Moshe is a little bit, he says you can eat it, but maybe it's better not to eat it on Thanksgiving, but more uh, uh, of the Rabbanim, the poskim, seem to connect it and not have any worry about Chukata Goyim. Numerous Talmudim of Rav Salavechik confirmed that he told them there was no problem to celebrate Thanksgiving. And it's known that the Rav usually ended his shear in Yeshiva University uh, early on Thanksgiving to catch an early flight back to Boston where he lived so he could have Thanksgiving with the family. And there are many other poskim who, who allow it. And it's interesting, by the way, that the annual Agudat Yisrael convention traditionally took part over the Thanksgiving weekend 
and turkey was on the menu and served to the participants. And I remember growing up, my my principal, my grammar school principal, very Zefet Sadik a very, very from person, Tamik Chacham. He uh, was with us on most uh, Thanksgivings and he was there, we ate turkey and he joined in it. So didn't present a problem. New Year's Eve parties are also a little bit interesting. We're coming up to, to New Year's Eve. Uh, when I remember growing up, uh, my parents who were members of Apol Mizrahi, there was always a New Year's party, um, but it was devoid of any religious connection. So Rav Moshe said, if it's purely secular, that it would be all right to do it just as a way people are off of work to get together, but not if they're um, in any way connecting to anything religious. Uh, I, I should point out, it's also interesting, some people don't like to use English dates. I had somebody, <clears throat> I had somebody who was over for our house for Shabbos lunch, and um, he said, I never use English dates, because I mentioned something that's taking place on March 8th or whatever it was, and he started to give me a little musr, and he said, I never use English dates for anything, I only use Hebrew dates. So I said to him, really? You never use English dates. He said, no. I said, after Shabbos, I want to see your credit card. I don't want to see the Hebrew date that's written on your credit card. And of course he said, oh, except for that and other things. Okay, in any way, um, um, <laughs> New Year's Eve has become, because we live in Israel, it has definitely become something more connected to what we would call Chukat goyim, especially this thing called Sylvester. Now, just to tell you a little bit about Sylvester, um, this was the name of the saint and Roman pope who reigned during the Council of Nicaea, 325 of the Common Era. The year before the Council of Nicaea convened, Sylvester convinced Constantine to prohibit Jews from living, living in Yerushalayim and arranged for the passage of a host of anti-Semitic le legislation. All Catholic saints are awarded a day on which Christians celebrate and pay tribute to that saint's memory. December 31st is St. Sylvester Day. Hence, celebrations on the night of December 31st are dedicated to Sylvester's memory, and that is clearly Asur for a lot of reasons. As we said before, it connects to something that very tragic in our history of persecution of Jews and also something religious. Now, something else that I think we're all familiar with, and that is Yom HaZikaron, the siren that goes off and we stand in solidarity and silence. Um, two minutes of silence. We have a siren, you know, um, there's a siren at 8 p.m., always on Yom HaZikaron. And it sounds for one minute at 11 a.m. the next morning for two minutes, during which time everyone should dedicate his or her thoughts to the memory of the fallen uh, soldiers, Love that there shouldn't be any more. The official ceremonies begin thereafter. And the question is, <clears throat> should we, and this has become a cause celeb and a, and a very divisive issue in Israel about standing for the, for the, uh, for the siren and uh, devoting this time uh, in tribute, both for Yom HaShoah and also for Yom HaZikaron. So um, the, the post scheme that have weighed in on this, um, almost all of them will say, first of all, uh, it has a purpose. Remember that Rav Moshe said, if there's something you're doing that has no purpose, why are you doing it? If, uh, if it has a purpose, fine. Uh, if it allows you to mix in society without transgressing any line of religiosity, fine. Um, but this has a purpose. Of course, this is, uh, and, and many of the post scheme have said, and I'll read some of that, that it's not considered to be a non-Jewish practice, even though it originated not with Jews. Nevertheless, the idea of standing, just as the rabbi said, Thanksgiving is about giving thanks. So therefore, many of the post teams said, what's wrong with that? It's a beautiful thing. You should give thanks. You're Jews, Yehudim. What's the root of Yehudi? To give thanks, lahodot. And so, toda, lahodot. So it makes sense. And so does this, because you're doing something to pay tribute to, to the soldiers. Rav Cook writes, standing silently for the soldier, for the fallen soldiers of Sahal 
contains within it the holy mitzvah of remembering the glory of the Kedoshim, meditating on the memory of the Chayalim and the mitzvah to be Moser Nefesh, one's life for the nation and conquering the land is tantamount to thinking Torah thoughts, he said. And even those who don't understand this must remember that which Hillel Hazakain said, Al tifrosh min hatzibur, do not <coughs> separate from the community. And indeed, that is also, we'll talk about in a moment, a major issue as well. So um, this has become uh, an area of great controversy, people taking pictures, the TV showing that some people didn't stand. Most, I think, intelligent uh, leaders in the Haredi community understand that this is not something that should be done uh, in, in your face, so to speak. Somebody doesn't want to go outside, doesn't want to stand outside, okay. But if you're out there and the siren is going off, stand still, stop your car. My wife doesn't like it, but when the siren comes, I go into the middle of our street, which is quite busy, and I take that chance and the cars will stop hopefully continue to do so. Um, some of them will always, almost always they say, I didn't hear the siren or I forgot or something else. Unfortunately, we're hearing a lot of sirens these days. So people may get them confused. Um, this idea of which needs also to be mentioned. And that is along with the concept of Chukata Goyim, you have to be careful about being Porish Min Hatzibur because that's also very problematic. So when it's kind of uh, a, a, a judgment call and you're not sure, should I, shouldn't I? Is it hukata goyim? Is it something that's intrinsically non-Jewish and maybe it's going to pull me away from Judaism? But if you're separating from the community, that can usually put you over the line because that's important too. Therefore, uh, the, the Sefer Lekach Tov says, it's written in Parshat Shmot. It came to pass in those days, Moshe grew up and went out. The Mephorshim say, what does that mean he went out? He went out to see the suffering of Israel. And this is what Hillel taught. Do not separate yourself from the community. If a person sees the community in pain, he should not say, I'll go to my house. I will eat and drink. Everything will be well with me. Rather, one should bear the burden with his fellow Jews, just as Moshe Rabbeinu did. If the community is in pain and someone separates from them and eats and drinks, two ministering angels accompany him, place food on his head and say, so-and-so separated himself from the community in their time of trouble. He shall not see the community's consolation. Finally, I'll just read uh, the statement of Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, the great leader of German Jewry, who summarizes the laws about Kukata Goyim and says as follows, you may imitate the nations among whom you live in everything which has been adopted by them on national grounds and not on grounds belonging to their religion or are immoral. But do not imitate anything which is irrational or has been adopted on grounds connected to their religion or for forbidden purposes. You may not therefore join in celebrating their holy days or observe customs with their basis on a religious view. You must also not do anything to disturb their holy days or mar their festival spirit. Do not parade your non-participation in their holy days in a manner that might arouse their animosity. This is the true method for a Jew to achieve holiness. So I'll stop here. And if anybody wants to ask a question or about a particular custom. So I last year did a Thanksgiving dinner here with 